morning. It's Monday, right? <laughs> okay. I was hoping it was Friday already, but no. Okay. So hopefully you had a good weekend. We do have a respite coming up with spring break next week. So I did update the pacing calendar a little bit, um, put us on track. So Friday we'll finish what, whatever we need to. Um, we are changing gears, so we're out of matrices now. We are now going into uh, sets, counting, those kind of things, which set us up for probability, because probability you need to know how to count. So I know how to count, but how to count bigger sets and those kind of things. So uh, what we're doing this week is really setting us up for what we're going to do after spring break. This is more the important stuff, the application. This is sort of general stuff. So again, Friday should be somewhat of an open day, but we'll see how far we get. Uh, today is a lot of vocabulary and symbols, but it's one of those things where when you get to the homework, if you don't know what a symbol means, how are you going to do it, right? Some of it is not too difficult. It's just setting it up. But again, it is somebody's come up with some ideas, put a symbol to represent it. So we've got to translate. It's like a new language. Um, secondly, over the weekend, you may have noticed I did update from WebAssign. So if you haven't done, and I, I went up through for Friday's lecture, so it's, it wasn't that I was intending everybody to have done through there. So you may see some zeros in the Canvas gradebook, but that's just because you hadn't started it in the WebAssign. There, I put a due date just in Canvas. It's not going to have any effect because there are no late penalties. It won't stop you from working on any of the previous homeworks, uh, but it's just kind of an indication. So I'll do the same thing with these chapter sevens, the end of the week, I'll update it. We'll probably put a due date by the end of spring break. If you don't get it done, it's, you know, it's not like you're gonna lose any points or anything, but it's, I got looking at web assignment, I says some people, there was a, a number that were not even started on the new content. Um, and again, it, that's fine, I guess, but I don't want you to get down to here in the review and start to do, try to do all the homework and try to learn everything in one week because it, it takes time, it takes time. So, and a number of you, there was a number that were already done with what we talked about on Friday, the 3.7. So uh, we've got that gamut. I just wanna help you all to kind of pace yourselves. And I know, a lot of education is set up as, with these due dates and their solid due dates and there's late penalties of 10% or 20% or whatever. And sometimes they're there, just there for no, no apparent reason. And sometimes I know, yeah, you have to get this. Thing. So our, dead, our real due dates are, we gotta get it done by the exam because this is when we're taking it. We gotta get ready for that. Other than that, yeah, you could do it anytime. So, uh, so you won't need any extensions for the canvas. It may show it as late, but that's okay. Um, at least it's okay with me, uh, but it's just, it's just a reminder. Points and everything are web assigned. It's all open until the date of the exam. All right. But I guess it was good. I did get some attention from people I hadn't heard from in a while. So um, that's good. Okay. So if you want, there's the full PowerPoints in there with everything in there. I, I've narrowed it down a little bit for my lecture, uh, taking it because it's there's a lot of slides in there, but there's a lot of examples. You may want to go over and take a look at those. Um, if you've had anything with sets or Venn diagrams before, which some of you may have, um, that's all this is today is sort of how to how to figure out what's in a set how to count what's in a set. Um, but it, a lot, what I find is a lot of people have never had this because it's not something necessarily covered in high school. Uh, it's not an algebra thing. And, and so, uh, so let's talk about what is a set. So what's a set? If I told you I got a set of something, a set of baseball cards. What does that mean? What might you think if you were, my brother collects baseball cards, or at least he used to. So what would be a set of baseball cards? What might constitute a set of baseball cards? 
how might I organize them into sets? Eh, Got to be a few baseball fans here, huh? First, they'd all be baseball cards, right? <laughs> I wouldn't have a, a baseball helmet in there. It's, that's not part of the set. So they look alike in that they're all baseball cards, right? But I might separate them to sets by, by teams or by players or eras. So there's various ways I could separate them. Like, say, okay, this is my stack of baseball cards from the 1950s. Boom, that's one set, right? So they have something in common, but they're also different. You know, each set is a different person. Joe DiMaggio, I think he was in the 50s, right? Uh, he might be in that set of the 50s, folks. So uh, a set is that way. What if I told you I had a set of China? A set of China, because actually we use that, right? Well, if you, yeah, having tea or coffee, right? Then you might visualize something like this. Oh, so how could I, how is that a set? What's, what makes that a set? What makes that set different than this set? Anyone? How are they different? How would you know to put this cup here and that cup there? What's that? Well, what does this one look like? Any pattern? No flowers. It's got some gold rim on it, right? So it's got the flowers. So you, you kind of know which set they belong to. But within each set, is everything the same? You know, there's similar things that kind of got the same uniform on, right? The same flower that makes them part of that set. But there's a teapot, a creamer. A, so they, they have different items in there. So within that set, there, there's differences as well. And so what we're coming to is that Today's lesson is going to be looking at things like numbers or names of things could be in one set versus another set, depending upon things that, that have something similar to the set, but they also can have some differences between each other, right? So I could put a set of cars and there would be things that are different about these cars, but if I did a set, you know, the compact cars in one set, they would be, they would have that similarity of being a compact car, but they might be by different manufacturers. Um, the other thing we're getting to today is we're doing something called cardinality. Cardinality just is a big word for how many are there, how many pieces are in there. So we start to look what are the elements of the set, what are the members of the set. So down here is maybe the easier one. Um, I guess I should do it over here because uh, online they can't see where I'm pointing, right? <laughs> okay. So down here, how many, how many things in this set are there? If we were to count, how many would we get? See one teacup here, maybe two, a second teacup. What about the saucers? Are those separate from, yeah, they're, cause you pick it up and there's a saucer. It's something different, right? So here's the third thing, maybe the fourth thing. How about the teapot or coffee pot? I don't know, I guess you could put either. Is that one thing or is that two things? Nobody wants to take a shot? You, that's where I could say is you could think of it as one thing, but if the top comes off and you lose it, and then you're thinking I've, I've lost part of it. So it's, you know, you could count it as two pieces because they, they can separate, but you know, one is not really complete without both of them. Whereas a teacup could be, you know, you could, leave this behind and just have a coaster or something but so we could say these are definitely separate um i'll leave it up to you which way you want to count it maybe it's not complete without it maybe you could say no it's two pieces and so they are separate uh, i don't know for sakes we'll just say oh that's teapot you need the whole pieces so sometimes things could be separate okay so what we just did is <coughs> called cardinality it's got a cardinality of five so what we're going to do today is we'll, we'll label these. This might be like a set A. Let's see. So we give them names. And then what I just did is I just did that the number in A is equal to 5. Okay. You might say 6 because there's a, the top of the teapot, but however you want. We just counted the pieces. Okay. Um, and then we might say this is set B. 
and this is set C or whatever we wanted, you know. And so we could count the pieces in each, what are the members of these sets, what are elements. Um, so that's kind of just a quick overview. That's where we're going. That's all we're doing today, really. The homework you'll do this will give you a few different sets made up of names of things, of, of events and stuff. What's this going to help us is eventually we'll get into something called probability, because we're also going to do some things with dice and see how we can build a set. Um, so that's what it's leading us into. So I, but I, I want you to sort of get something where you could visually see a set is a thing. It's a collection of stuff. And we just define it. So here's another. And I didn't like their picture. I mean, just a bunch of dots. What, you know, what's that? <laughs> OK. But what we call this is whatever this set is, it's got dots. We could have our teapots in there, whatever. And whatever's inside this square, they're called elements of the set, members of the set, the items in the set, you know. OK, so it's just a collective items. Again, those items have some sort of similarity that makes them part of it. You know, if we're on the same team, we're all wearing the same jerseys, but we got different names on the back, right? We got our own names. So, so there's similar things, but there's also differences. That's what I want you to see. So we'll use this as kind of, you know, just go through the process of how do we do these things. We use capital letters. So here's an, here's an example of a set. Set W is equal to Amazon, eBay, and Apple. The set N is the numbers one, two, three. What do those, what those three dots mean? Keep going. So, it, so one set is infinite. It keeps going. The other set, up, the first one, W, is what we would call a finite set. It's, it's got a limited number of things in there. So you could actually count it. Uh, we can't really count the number in set in, right? Because it goes on forever. It's uncountable, is what we say. That's what infinite is. Some notation. This little guy here is the element symbol. You can kind of see it's sort of an E. Uh, I think it's a Greek letter, epsilon. Uh, so this, when we use this, it means it's a way of saying that X is an element of A. So we know we have some set A that has X in it. Um, we can also use the, the line through it to say something is not an element of A. Okay, and Again, some of this is just, okay, that makes sense, right? The slash through, it's not of A. Um, so some examples. Amazon is an element of W, right? Because it's right here. But Microsoft is not an element of W because it's not there. Okay, so we just use these symbols and so we have to know what they mean. Two is an element of the net of the in, but zero, we could say zero is not an element of n. Negative numbers aren't up there, so we got those. So far so good? Okay. Um, when two sets are equal, it means they're the same, right? Does that make sense? They're exactly the same. So they have the same number of things. They have exactly the same things. Uh, the order isn't so important. So we've got five, negative nine, one, three. We could switch up the order. But the items, the elements are all the same. So those sets are equal. Okay. Um, they could be close. But if they're not completely the same, like this one has four, this one has six, they're not equal. We can call something, uh, B could be a subset of A. And when we do it this way, this symbol, this means subset. And with this little line here, this is sort of comes from the equal sign. They, in this case, when I use this symbol, they could be equal as well. So a subset means it's, it's a little bit, it's part of it. So like, the example we saw, EB and Apple are both in W, so they are subsets. This would be a smaller set of W. Um, or 1, 2, 3, 4 is a subset of 1, 2, 3, 4. They're also equal, right? So that's where this little line here comes in. We're going to see in the next slide, there is this symbol, which is called a proper subset, which means they can't be equal, right? We took the little equal off, kind of like that less than or equal to sign. Uh, without the equal part. 
Uh, so when they call it a proper subset, I don't know if, why, why we have the other one. Why don't you say there's equal sets and then there's subsets? But again, they didn't ask me. And if they did, they didn't listen, right? So this is somebody came up with this. Uh, so if it's a proper subset, it means they are subsets of each other, but they're not equal to each other. And again, I, I teach at the community college. They have a special competency. This is like out of five things you need to know about sets, this is one of them. You have to know what a proper subset is. They're not equal, but they're, they could be the subset. So all of these are proper subsets. They, they don't include the whole set. Uh, they're just part of it. Okay. We also have something called the empty set. So you'll see this, you know, it's, there's nothing in this set. Um, and it has no elements. So it's actually a subset of every set because every set has nothing in it as well. Okay, I guess. Kind of, sometimes it gets into a little philosophical thing, but, but if they ask for what are all the subsets, we always got to include that, that, uh, Empty set. Okay. Doing okay so far? Not getting too bored? Okay. I was kind of bored going. I, t I, I had cut out a lot of size. I thought this is kind of. But it's important stuff when you go to do the homework because you got to get it. So here we talked a little bit of finite set versus infinite. Finite, there's only so. There's, you can count how many items are in there. Finite. Infinite means you can't count them. They, there's so many. It keeps going, right? Not only can you know because you get tired, but because after you know, get to a certain stage, there's, there's, there's a, just as many to keep going. So that, 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 we keep going. So infinite versus a finite. But these are, again, these will be important to discuss. Sometimes in business, you might think of, even though it is kind of finite, it's like, you know, 10 million people, maybe that's so big for your data system. It's, it's equivalent to being infinite. So sometimes in a business situation, you might have to treat a set of, of customers or something as infinite, uh, especially if you're in marketing, right? You want to think that we don't have all our customers. They're, they're, we'll get some new ones. So it's kind of like an infinite set. So that concept. We use Venn diagrams. Venn diagrams are just circles. Some guy named Venn came up with this idea. What's so cool about a circle is it's got two things. What are the two things a circle has? I think a radius and a diameter, no, circumference, no. An inside and an outside. That's what all we're using them for. So if you're in the set, where are you? You're in the circle. If you're outside the set, where are you? You're out of the circle. So that's all we're doing is it's a visual way to depict what's in the set and what's not in the set. Okay. And we're going to see we can draw multiple circles so we can get more than one set. Um, Elements of A are the points inside the region, and the stuff that's not in A, as we'll see as a complement, are outside of the set. And here's some examples. I'll just kind of go through them. So uh, you'll, you'll, we'll kind of deal with this. So here's the sort of the symbolic way of representing X as an element of A. This is a visual way that it's in the circle, so it's in the set, it's an element. So there's a pictorial way, a symbolic way. Um, this is showing X is not an element of A. And again, we see X here outside the circle. Okay, so just a visual, it's a way to do things. Uh, they'll help us organize things. Uh, this is showing us that B equals A. So the two sets are the same. So here's the circle and it could we could call it A or we could call it B, it's the same thing, right? Uh, this one's showing that B is a subset of A. It's fully contained in A. It's actually a proper subset, right? But we could actually use either one of these symbols would be accurate. Uh, but this is the most, maybe the most accurate because it, it really tells us everything that they're not equal, right? B is not equal to A. It's a smaller part of A. Um, this one over here says that they, they don't even talk to each other. They're completely different sets, right? One's a set of baseball cards, the other one's a set of football cards or something. You know, I guess you could have somebody who did both. I don't know. But they're completely different sets, right? Like our teapot set. You know, here's the white teapot set, china set. Here's the flowered teapot set. They don't really intermix. They haven't had any. Here's one where there's a possibility where you could have some overlap. 
Maybe A is uh, pickup trucks and B is red, tr red cars, right? red vehicles. So these in the middle would be red pickup trucks. So there could be an overlap between two different sets. Uh, so we represent it with that overlap. Okay. Sometimes the overlap is empty. So we could, we could have this here, but there might not be anything in here. So, but it's just, just a way of visualizing what sets look like. Okay. So this is one. Um, oops, let's come back here. Is it doing? Come on. What happens? Okay. I want. So here's just kind of a um, example from the text. So they give us these uh, set of customers, and I, I think they're all German mathematicians or Einstein Bohr. But this was for a book company, um, and so they went in the database, got it. And again, I, I took a lot of the words out. Uh, so these were all the customers um, in their book database. These are the customers who push, purchased a cookbook. So that we call set A. These were the ones that uh, purchased a mystery book. Just these guys. Are there any overlaps? Are there any ones that did both? Well, we can see here, Bohr is in both, Heisenberg's in both. Um, and then if we compare with the, the larger set, we see that uh, Dracht and Einstein are in the group, but they aren't down here. And Schrogendinger um, is down here, but, you know, so he's part of the other set. So how could we do this with a Venn diagram? Um, it looks like the overlapping region would have these two. Uh, these guys would be in A. This is in B. And we've got one here, Milliken, who's not even in the set, not in either of those sets. So he's outside both circles. Again, we could do this with a Venn diagram. The, the homework's going to have you do this. They give you some information. They ask you to make a Venn diagram. Um, then they give you a multiple choice. You can choose it. So you, I guess you don't have to make it, but you have to be able to recognize it. Uh, we're also going to give you a Venn diagram where we're counting. So, you know, how many are in A? One, two, three, four. Right. So that's a cardinality thing. How many are in B? One, two, three. So notice these folks get, you know, they're both in A and B. Okay. How many are not in either one? There's only one that's, you know, they didn't buy any book, at least not yet. So we can represent it with a Venn diagram. And again, some of the, the, the couple of homework problems that ask you to use a Venn diagram. There might be some that don't ask you, but you might find the Venn diagram a success, uh, easier way to visualize which set is which. Okay. And next we're going to get into operations of sets. So we'll talk about how would we represent these two people specifically, or these and those. And so that's the other thing. So we start getting into this whole area of logic. Okay. So here's the concept. We could talk about two sets taking the union of two sets. Union is, now this is where it gets a little confusing. For the word union, we're putting both sets, if they're a member of A or B, and B or B, uh, this is the and or, this is the inclusive or. So usually like if someone asks you if you want some ice cream, you want some chocolate or vanilla, you think I have to choose one, right? This is the kind of or where you could have chocolate, vanilla, or you could have a swirl. You could have both. You have a scoop of each. So this is the kind of inclusive or in logic. Okay. Union is anything in either of the sets. Sort of think of it as either or. And we represent it as a Venn diagram, something in A, B, or something in both of them. So it's, this is the shaded region. Anything in the green region would be in the union of two sets. So it's just putting the two sets together. This one is called the intersection. So this is the exclusive and. 
sometimes when we th hear the word and, we say, okay, include everything, right? But this and is sort of exclusive. It, that you have to be a member of Club A and B to get in. If you're only a member of Club A, sorry, you can't get in. You're not, you don't have the B club. In, you know, so you have to have both in this case. You have to be both an element of A and B to be considered in the intersection. And just think of, you know, we have street intersections, right? What's the, the intersection? It's where the two streets cross. It's that middle part that you're not supposed to play in. But when you were a kid, that was the best place to play ball, right? But all the cars came through. But yeah, you got out of the way when the cars came. I don't know. At least we did. <laughs> up in the sort of so again the shaded region is the intersection so it's it's a it's an exclusive and this is the hardest part for me of logic when you see the and i think of everything right or i think of one or the other but you have to get to think of the english the way we use it in english everyday english is different from the way we use it in logic okay so part of what we're learning here is not so much this concepts here yes we are learning it but think of it as like going to the gym you do some curls to build up a bicep not because you're going to do a lot of curls with a, a weight but because you want a nice looking bicep or you need some muscle to pull something you need it for something else this uh you may never use i hear people say well i never use that well you may not use it directly but again remember what you're doing is you're learning how to learn you get to a new job, I'll tell you, there's some weird stuff that they're going to have you, you know, because each company has its own vocabulary and how they want you to do things, right? Procedures. You're going to have to learn them. That's what this is also going to teach you. Okay. So now we're ready to start operating with these things. Try to keep track of time because it was like, it's a long one. Um, logical equivalence. So the union, for elements to be in A union B, they have to be in A or B. They can be one or the other. They could be in both, but they don't have to be. So it's kind of that inclusive or, either or, I call it, right? The intersection, they have to be in both. You have to have both merit badges, right? You have to have both A and B. You have to have both the, the jacket and the tie. So it's a real high class place. Okay, some examples. If this is A, A, B, C, D, and B is C, D, E, F, then we can look at the union is all of the things. When we write the union, though, notice, um, what is it? C, C and D are in both sets, but we only write it once when we write the union. Okay, so it's kind of like, that's the hard part. It's just kind of going through and say, okay, we need A, B, C, D. Oh, we've already got C, D, so we have to add E, F to get the union. It's, it's both sets put together. Okay, so that's, uh, that's how we get our union. Can anyone spot what would be the intersection? Right, it's the things that are in both. So there's our overlap, our intersecting region. It'll be just C and D. Okay, we don't put the A, B. And again, we go through these um, types of problems. So far, so good. And again, uh, you may, you know, if it's if you're new to these symbols, it takes a little bit, but uh, the up, I just the U for union, the down for the intersection. Um, get used to it. There's another concept. So this is uh, there's a special name for something that is not in a set. Uh, actually, the set of all the things that are not in the set, and we call that the complement. So a complement. And, and we indicate it with this little, it looks like a, a derivative sign, right? We use that for derivatives, a little apostrophe. But in this case, it's read as a not, so not A, or the complement of A. Whatever things are in the bigger set, in the whole set, sort of the universal set. Uh, universal set is everything we're talking about. So we're talking about like cars, it'd be all the cars. Um, but maybe set A is Toyotas. So... Nissan, uh, is Nissan a Toyota product? I, sometimes Toyota has many different names. Well, let's go with Ford. I know Ford is not a Toyota. I don't think so until they change it. So Toyotas would be set A, a Ford would be not in A, but it is a car, right? So we do it this way. Uh, this is set builder notation. So we've talked about this symbol, which is element. 
as we would translate it. And this line is just a way of saying, it's a shortcut for saying such that. So just to, you know, again, it's just vocabulary. So this is read, X is an element of S. It's in the set, it's in the big set, such that X is not an element of A. So that's kind of the math, the math ease of that sentence. Um, again, it's not real important that we uh, use it a lot because we're not getting deep into uh, logic. We're just kind of getting some concepts of, of what are insets so that we can count them when we get to probability, which is what we're really trying to get to use. So this is the picture, the shaded regions, everything in the universal set, which we use with a rectangle. This is the universe. A is whatever's in A is in here, but the green is all the stuff that's not in A. So that would be the complement. And again, we're going to get things where there's maybe three different circles. And again, anything outside the circle of A is in the complement of A. Okay. So for something to be not in A, right, the complement of A, not in A. Here's an example. If you've got the universal set, the big set S, E, B, C, D, what are the things that are not in A? Well, E, F, G. So... And if you put those two sets together, what do we get? A with not A, you get everything. So that's the idea of a complement is you complete something, right? It's the pieces that are missing. Um, and this one was like five slides and I decided just to shortchange it a little bit. If we look at this, uh, what does this describe? Remember, a was the people who bought cookbooks. I think B was they bought mystery books. And Milliken didn't buy any books, right? Uh, so what it's showing is we could rep, you, you get some variety that you could do. We knew Milliken was not in either set. So we could do C as a separate sort of set uh, that he hadn't bought any books yet. Um, and he's not even connecting with A. Or you could do it connecting, but that these regions are empty. Nobody's in there, okay? So it's, but it's set up, maybe Milliken wants to buy a cookbook so we could, you know, if Milliken all of a sudden bought a cookbook, we'd put them right here in this little region. So we see we get multiple regions. We get, um, you know, in here is someone who is in all three groups, all three sets, I guess I should use that, but, um, this one is in B and C at the same time, right? So that's an intersection. This one is in A and C. So the intersection of A and C. But also, you know, th this part's also the intersection of B and C and A and C, but it's, uh, it's also the intersection of all three, right? So we get these different regions, and then wherever we put that name tells us something about which circles they are in or which circles they're not in. Okay. So, but both these Venn diagrams are, are pretty much logically equivalent. Um, but the second one is sort of set up for what might happen in the future, right? You might add something to group C or something. Okay. Now we start talking about outcomes. And so we're gonna, this is starting to set us up for probability. So we're gonna talk about flipping a coin. So if you flip a coin, what, what are the outcomes? You can get a, two sides to a coin. Have you ever seen a coin? I know you're all quiet. Okay, heads or tails, right? Simply you flip it, heads or tails. It lands on the middle and you know, get stuck in the mud or something, we, we, that's a do-over, right? So we just count heads or tails. Um, but what we're get, as we set up in probability, what we're looking at is what is the set of all the things that could happen, say, if we flipped it two times, right? Because if you're making a decision, maybe you don't just want to flip it once, maybe you want twice, maybe you want three times. Um, but let's say we're going to flip it two times, so twice in succession then the set of all the possible outcomes, what could happen? Well, we could get a head head, a head tail, a tail head, a tail tail. Um, 
And now while these middle two might seem to be sort of the same thing, right? One head and one tail, they happened in a different order. So they actually are a different event. Okay, so there's something unique. So when we're counting events and we're making a set of, of things that happened, order is important. We count the different orderings. So these are so that we could say that this set has four different elements, right? Even though those two in the middle are one head, one tail, um, heads, heads, tails, tails. Uh, so that's four different items. So when we sort of get to cardinality and count them, we need to do that. Um, and what they had this whole couple pages, they call this a, a sort of a cross product. So what we're doing is there's two items and we're matching up um, We're matching up a first flip of a heads with a heads and a tails, a second flip, first flip of a tails with a heads and a tails. So they call that a Cartesian product. Again, we're not going to get too big on it. So if I had one, if I'm rolling one die, one dice, what are the all the things that could happen? Well, I can get a one, two, I guess it is a dice. When it's a die, it's two. So we'll get to that. So the set is just one through six. Simple, right? That's how we count it. What if I had two dice that were I was rolling? In that case, I look at it as, because sort of I could think of it two different ways. We're going to look at one. They could be two different colored dice, right? And I could see that I've got a first dice and a second. Usually when you roll them, maybe one lands first and the other second. So um, in that case, we want to count the order sort of important. So when I have two dice, it's not just... Well, there's two, there's six, and six, so that's only 12 things that could happen, maybe. But there's actually 36 different things because of the ordering. Um, so I can get a one and a one, a two and a one, but that's different than a one and a two. So they, they do it with the colored dice. And the textbook does spend a bit of time talking about um, whether you can distinguish it or not. I'll tell you what, in probability, it doesn't matter whether it's a green and a pink dice. They could both be the same. They could both be green dice. But there's two dice there, so we want to do the same sort of counting because nature knows there's two dice. There's one that lands. There is a way to distinguish them one way or the other. So there's going to be, when we count this set, it's got 36 different items in here, right? And each one is really kind of unique. You know, the only ones that are the same, you know, six and six, five and five, those occur once. But a five and a four, a four and a five, those are going to occur twice because, you know, the order is important as we go through. Um, and then you also th sort of think, well, what's the, the sum of the dice? Because in dice games, sometimes that's what you're interested in. Well, this is nine, but this is also another way to get nine. So there's, you know, sometimes when we get to probability, we're looking how many different ways can I make nine, right? And this is if you've played craps game, uh, that's there's sort of the dividing is seven. And you'll see seven is right here along the diagonal. Seven is you actually has the largest number of ways of being made than any other number, right? 12 can only be made one way, two can only be made one way. So again, just getting you over to, we'll be using this when we get to probability because we do a lot with dice and probability. Counting, that's all it is. But we have to count these things as separate. Okay, that's why I want you to see. This is a good picture to maybe store in your computer somewhere and pull it back up because two different colors, it, it makes a lot of sense. This is a way a lot of times it'll show us it's less interesting, but this is the ordered set, a one and a one, a one and a two, a two and a, it's really the same thing, but it's showing it as ordered pairs, right? First roll was a five, second roll was a four. Um, as we go through each of these, uh, for instance, five, three. So we'll five, three, let's see where it's at. Five, three, here it is. That's different than three, five, right? So these two, you know, you might think of them the same outcome, maybe the same result if you're playing a board game, you're still going eight squares, but they're different events, okay, two different ways. Okay, oh good, we're done with that part. Cardinality is the easier part, and I've been throwing it in as we go so that um, all it is is we're gonna count how many things are in each of these things. Um, now, they're going to give us a few formulas if you have a really lot of things. And again, we'll use, you'll, we'll come back to them when we get to probability. But in the homework, as far as what I could see, most, it's all 
little smaller sets where you're just kind of getting the, the ideas and, and the counting. Um, so cardinality, um, if this is set A, we represent this little n as the number in A is six. Okay. We did that with the teapots, right? And we counted five pieces because we counted the teapot as one thing because, you know, that lid is really supposed to be attached and it's not a teapot without its lid. Um, so there, we got five things, six, yeah. So we would say, if we call this set uh, B, the number in B we would say was five. Okay. Cardinality, that's all there is to it. Um, so what's the cardinality of S? Any ideas? Three. Cool. Let us be the set of outcomes when two dice are rolled. So we just did that. If we roll two dice, how many different things were there in there? Six by six was 36. Good. This should be an What's the cardinality of the empty set? Zero. Nothing in it. So, okay, good. So you kind of, this is kind of like the homework. It might be a little more complicated, but those kind of things. Um, the, the thing is we want to get to is, well, what if we add two sets together or, or take the union of two sets? Does that mean like if there's three in A and three of B that there's going to be six in the union? Well, they said don't go too quick, right? Because when we take a union, there could be some overlap, right? B is in here, C is in both. So if we said that there's six things in A union B, I think they have it down there. We'd be wrong, <laughs> right? There's not six because we, you know, and the way we have to visualize is what's in the intersection. So here's sort of a, a compli more complicated way. We take what's in A and B, the six, but we subtract off what's in the intersection. That's what we'll use when we get to probability and we got larger sets and it's harder to keep a track. When it's small like this, you just count. Oh, there's only four things there. <laughs> Lay it out, you know. What's in the over section, just don't count things twice, right? If, I'm, if I don't be careful, I counted six because I, I was really counting B and C twice, right? Or yeah, yeah, it's counting B and C twice. So that's how I was coming up with six. And there's not six things, there's only four. So on smaller stuff, don't worry so much about this formula. Just count them, but just watch for that. You know, just don't count things twice. And sometimes in a bigger Venn diagram, we might count things three or four times, depending upon how many, you know, if it's in that center part. Okay. So they come up with all these rules. I'm kind of going to, you know, if you, if you just find ways to kind of list out the sets when it's finite, you'll be able to just count. Okay. And again, just don't count things twice. And once you list it out, it's pretty good. So, uh, you know, you have a union, you just have to remember, well, whatever's in the intersection is going to get counted twice. So either don't count it twice or go ahead and count it twice, and, but subtract it off. However you want to do it. There's two ways to do it. Um, the intersection, this is, I've never used this. This is more confusing. It's more easy to just kind of go what's in the intersection and count it, right? Rather than, oh, everything in A, you could, because to do this one, you've got to know what's in the intersection anyway, right? So if you have to, if you know what's in the intersection, just count it. It's kind of like this is, you know, that's how math people are though. Oh, I can come up with a new formula. Well, why? Well, because it's fun for me. Well, it's not fun for me, so let's not do it. Let's just do the easy way. Okay. So we just want to know how many are in the set. Um, and this again, it just belabors it. If they're disjoint, there is no intersection. Doesn't we don't have to subtract anything, or you could subtract zero. So, but again, I don't need all this second stuff but it, it was there so i kind of just let's go through it just count it okay for most of what we're doing today just count it um so we can see yeah i got this set i got this set i want their union now here's one two three four. Oh, i already counted b and c and d by six so i'd get a total six so that's how i do it so i just i don't count them twice i say okay you already been counted you don't get credit twice right so just be careful how you count That'll do it. Or be sloppy in how you count and then just take off the intersection. Make sense? Okay. A couple more examples. Um, and again, if they're disjoint, notice there's nothing that's going to get counted twice. You just check, oh, nothing the same. Just count them all. There's six. 
there is no intersection. Okay. Um, almost there. And again, sometimes they'll, a little bit later, they, they don't give us the set, but they tell us how many are in each and then how many are sort of in the both A and B. That would be the intersection. So we could subtract it off. That's where we maybe need to use this. And again, usually we get this when we get into our probability. Um, the idea of the complement, remember? So complement, whatever's in A, the comp nothing in the complement is that this kind of they're two separate sets, uh, but together they make the universal set. They're everything we're talking about. So it makes sense that if you take the number in the universe and you subtract A, you'll get what's in the complement or vice versa. Okay. It's just, but that's an important concept because sometimes as we get larger groups, we know how many like how many people took the survey. We know how many are here, but we want to know how many didn't choose this option. Well, we just subtract it. Okay, you don't actually have to go count them because that might take a lot of time, right? So, it's a concept that can do it. Um, and here's a visual of it. Again, just kind of counting. Um, oh, good! I'm at the end already, and I didn't use up all my time. So, be able to count what's in a set. And again, a lot of this thing, go through the homework. Uh, we have Friday to come back on if, you know, so it's kind of like go through the homework. I've scanned it, but there might be some things that just don't make sense to you or something. And a lot of times with this, what I find out is it's the symbols that it takes some getting used to. So you might want to have a little cheat card where you have it down and you, you know, this is the union, this is intersection, this is element, this little bar says such that, you know, what, whatever you need to do. But we're not going to, heavily test you on logic this is really a foundational thing that's why we're doing two together two sex we just need you to be able to do this so we can get you to probability which is what is very valuable and usable especially in marketing uh, programs so if you're in marketing this is great even supply chain has this probability thing of you know well there's a chance it might not make it to the ship right so we gotta we can put those things in there when we're doing our supply chain, when we're doing our marketing, there's a chance I might be able to convert you to buy my stuff, but I might not be able to. So, you know, we, we throw those into our calculations on what our profit might be and those kind of things. This is just a foundation to kind of get us going. Yes, uh, this has to do, yeah, sorry. I, I, so here's the set, here's this. So to get the complement, you have to basically take this out and uh, what you see that the complement only has two items, E and F, right? Because everything else is in A, but A is missing E and F. And that's how I would do it. I just look at the two sets. It's small enough. Hey, E and F aren't there. There's two things. Boom. I wouldn't use the formula for this. But those formulas may become helpful as we go further. So I, I just put them up there. When we get to it and we got larger sets, we'll, we'll come back to this and we'll say, yeah, remember... We're not too, we can't count all this stuff, so we're going to use some of these formulas. But at this stage, the formulas are, are what kind of hold you back because you're going, what? They're, but, you know, counting, you just look and say, oh, EF, there's two things that are not in, that are in the universe, but that are not in A. Does that make sense? Okay. That's what I got for you. Any questions? Any concerns? Keep moving forward. Uh, remember, I did make a deal. If you can, if you need to go back to anything from exam one, um, you can over spring break, but you need to get at least all the matrix stuff done. I want to see that done because I want you to have success on test two. And to have te success on test two, you really got to have done this stuff. And then because now this week we're getting into the sort of foundation, then we get the probability. And then after spring break, we got two days of review. We got to come back to matrices because that's what's on the test, right? So over spring break, I'll make the, my plan is to make the, uh, um, the videos for the solutions for the practice tests that we have or the review tests. So I'll, I'll do that over spring break so you can start reviewing. But I, again, I'm just wanting you to do really well on the second test. I want you all to do really well. And I think it's very possible because... We don't have to worry about calculus that we, we just expected you remembered everything from it. So this is just, it's kind of all new stuff. Matrices, use your calculator, learn how to use it, set stuff, and then probability, just count, and then make a, you know, you'll see probability is actually fairly easy. So it's just division. So um, 
live long and prosper, right?